All right, everybody. Welcome to this B2B talk, C++ templates. It comes in two parts. We're now at the first part, and directly after that, we will have the second part. My name is Andreas Fertig. I work as a trainer and consultant for C++. And I'm also the creator of C++ Insights. If you haven't heard about that, um, go and head over to cppinsights.io and have a brief look on it or simply wait until I use the tool during my talk myself. This is a live virtual conference, which um, I think is incredibly great that we can have these and John and all the crew put so much effort into trying to recreate what we used to have in live or in-person conferences, um, yet some things are missing. So, for example, you cannot see all the volunteers which are helping behind the scenes because now they are completely gone to you. But in fact, they are managing all the StreamYard stuff for me such that this live stream um, can occur. And you also do not see what John and the others uh, do to get this thing or keep that thing running. And asking for a round of applause wouldn't be that much helpful because uh, the people who should hear it cannot hear it, um, sadly, due to the setup. So the basic idea is what you can do is at least one of you can start creating one of these questions and answers and write something in there like a hand of applause for all the CPPCon stuff and all the volunteers. And everybody who likes to jump in there just upvote it to show your appreciation for having the opportunity about this event. Thank you for that. So, as I said, my name is Andreas Fertig, and my last name has a meaning in German. It's an adjective, and if you translate it into English, it comes with quite a few meanings attached, like finished, ready, complete, or completed. Keep that in mind, I will refer to that later. But there's another thing, um, because it's an adjective, adjectives in German are spelled with a lower first letter usually. So the spell checker always, most of the time at least, assumes that I'm referring to an adjective when I type my own last name. But the last name goes with a capital F as the first letter. So I constantly fight with the spell checker who is right in which situation. And I think um, we are even here, so he catches a few of my bugs, and uh, I am right at the other times. But today we are here to talk about templates and the idea of what is generic programming. And generic programming, I have here a couple of phrases to describe it. It's a method to implement algorithms and data structures in the most general but still sensible way. So it's a way of abstraction. Algorithms are written in terms of types, which is specified later. And this is a very interesting thing because we are essentially writing templates and algorithms for them without knowing the exact type. We have in mind and we use a couple of properties of the type. Um, we may call member functions if we expect an object to pass in. And if that object we are passing in sadly doesn't have this member functions, then we get one of these nasty page long or longer compile errors resulting from a template instantiation. But we will talk about this later. The term generic programming was originally coined by David Mercer and Alexander Stefanov. There's a paper attached to my slides. I will upload them after this talk is done or the two talks are done. Um, it's a good read, so have a look at it. And generic programming in general helps us to reduce redundancy and with that programming our thought, simply because we have to write an algorithm only once because the types are flexible and we can reuse it for a set of types which come with the same requirements or the same properties. So this gives us more flexibility. And of course, if we happen to catch a bug there, we have to fix that bug only once. So that's a, another really nice thing. So what are templates? Templates are a kind of pattern for the compiler which the compiler fills out. 
This process is called instantiation. And it's a process you know very well because without filling out a template, nobody of you would listen to this talk because to be here, even if that may be your home, but in this live stream or in Remo, you had to fill out this order form for the CPP conference itself. So this was a template. It helps the organizers to give, uh, to get your data in a structured way, and it provides you with the structure of what they need from you, what they want from you, and so on. So templates are much like this. We can instantiate them. That's like when you fill them out with different types or different values. So if I sign up for the conference, I will fill in different values than you, but you can be free to offer me your bank account number. I can use that, of course. That, that would be great. So each instantiation of a template comes with a new type or a new value if the combination is different. And that will result in additional code. And that sometimes is referred to code bloating because... Um, people see that they have written only one template and now they are getting three um, different versions of a function out. And they often overlook the fact that this is similar to what they have done if they would have written the code themselves three times, but with three different types. So we will also look into this. And templates reduce a lot of writer's work because of what's, what's I, what I have said previously, they help us to implement functions only once, but use them multiple times, but with a slightly different type. And we will see that when we are talking about types, because they are known to the compiler at compile time, we can even query properties of these type. And if we have only a slight version, then we can even in one function say, okay, we do an exception for that type we call the different member functions or function or whatsoever. So we can do a lot of these things because types are known at compile time, which is very helpful here. Then there are, we have three different types of templates, roughly. We have function templates, we have class templates, and we have in C++ 14 variable templates. The key thing here, if you're talking to someone, is it always starts with type, and is followed by a template. Okay, we have function templates, we have class templates. We don't have template functions or template classes. There's no such thing like this. Walter Brown gave a good talk, um, I don't remember, a few years ago at CppCon. It may have been a lightning talk where I teased into that and compared it with um, chocolate milk and milk chocolate. The one thing we have, the other thing we don't. Templates in general are always initiated by the keyword template. Um, you can spot them easily there because they all the time need to start with that keyword followed by ankle brackets. So don't get scared away by that. It's fairly easy. Aside from the different types of templates, we have different kinds of template parameters. Um, to be precise, we have three different types. We have type parameters, which may be the most commonly used type, um, at least in my daily use. And that's the case whenever we are trying to substitute a concrete type, like a char, an int, or even our own class. Then we are talking about a type parameter because essentially we are passing in a type and we will work with that type later in the class or function. Then we have non-type template parameters. They are often values like 3, 42, something like this. A few things are excluded, so we cannot pass in floating point numbers or strings in terms of um, C style strings or C arrays. And some of these restrictions are lifted since we have C++20, which if you should know that, we have since uh, a week ago or something like that, officially now. And they make a lot of these, or at least some of these limitations go away. And then we have a third type of template parameters. And 
if you happen to not use that type for a long time or never stumbled over it and think that's all right, that's a template template parameter and we require that every time you're passing a template to a parameter of a template itself. So it's it's like passing a template to a template essentially. And then we need to prefix um, that thing with another template. We will see that in the second part of the talk. So after all that introduction, here's a first sample of how templates look. It all starts with the template head as it's shown here in A. It's introduced by the template keyword followed by the opening ankle bracket and closed by the ankle bracket in line number three. Inside these ankle brackets, we now can specify type parameters, non-type parameters or template, um, template parameters. In this case here, I'm using a type parameter. I give that thing a name, it's T. And I have a non-type template parameter, as you can see in C, which is of type size T, and I give that the name N. And then next, we can see I'm creating a function template here. Its name is size, it's const expert, and returns auto. And what it takes is, it takes something special. It takes a const T, so my T is the one I declared in B above in the template. So this is deduced by the compiler. And then it takes essentially an unnamed variable or an unnamed parameter here by reference, and it expects that that thing is an array. This is the syntax here. And the size of this array is deduced by the compiler, which um, you can see because I'm using n here, the size t variable, which the compiler is able to deduce for me. This is a way how we can manage to maintain the arrayness of an array while passing it to a function and not let it decay to a pointer. What this function next then does is simply return n, so the size of this array. And that's the reason why the parameter has no name here. I, I don't actually need to refer to that. I only need the size. And what I can do then is I can use this in conjunction with this jar buffer on line 12 and 15 in this raw for loop. And I can query the size of these buffers of this jar array and let the compiler do the heavy lifting. So there are no size offs involved, no size off divided by another size off, which then goes awfully still wrong if you're passing in an array of pointers, things like that. So this is a very good way of handling this. But pardon me for using a range based uh, or a regular for loop here. You should refer to a range based for loop. Usually I say um, don't do that at work, only do it at home. But as these times um, home is work, don't even try it out at home. Use the range based for loop as long as you can. This is for some special cases, but it shows the power of templates. So we already see in the function template, here's another version of a function template that right, we have this code example where I'm creating a function template called min. It takes a type name t, a single t, and as arguments for this function, it takes a and b, both are of type const t ref. So both are references of this type t, I'm instantiating this template myth or I'm calling it with. And internally what it does then is it compares A and B and figures out, out which one is the smaller value and returns that one down. The return type of min is T as well, so everything depends on that type. Looking down here, how I'm using it from the user's perspective side in line 12, I can simply call min, parsing the variables A and B to it, and nobody will notice that I just invoked or called the template as long as you're passing in the right parameter combination. There are now a few specialties involved when it comes to templates, because this thing here only compiles with a set of integers, because I said that my function template takes two t's, and if it comes to templates, there are no implicit conversions. So the compiler expects that both a and b are of the same type. And A is the leading one here. So if A is of type int, B has, of, has to be of type int as well. 
and so it has the return value or the return type. I will now switch over to C++ Insights. Oh no, let's do the next thing first. Um, this is how a template instantiation looks like. And this is what C++ Insights shows you and what we will see in a minute live. So from the former example, I know, look behind the scenes, what happens if I instantiate such a template. And what we can see is that essentially the compiler makes up the template function, which we provided it with, and fills in the types. In my case, int all over the place. We can see in line number 10, return value is int, a return type is int, the two parameters a and b are of type const int ref because we are calling it with an int. And if you look at this in C++ Insights, which we have here, and I don't want to update. And if I do the transformation here, then we can in fact see that's the very same thing as we saw before. C++ Insights in that case even tells us where this instantiation comes from, but it seems to be awfully wrong. If you're looking at the right, you have to, oh, I have to remove that here. It gets better. I do the transformation once again, but without providing the specialization, then now we can see it comes from line number 16 and line number 16 here is my printf. And what I told you before is if I change types here, even if I simply make that a short, and which usually would result in an integer promotion, then the compiler will say, oh no, there's no matching function to call min because you provided me with an int and a short, but you're claiming that both have to fit in T. And T is initially deduced as int, so your short doesn't match here. There are no implicit conversions when you're calling templates like this. All right. Are there any questions so far? All right, none so far, let's continue. So we halfway saw this, um, what C++ Insights shows us here for an instantiation, we can also call a specialization because there's a special case for an int the compiler makes up here because we are requesting it. We can provide specializations on our own and that's for another good. Here I have a different example. I have a function called equal, which returns a bool. It's a function template taking, once again, two template parameters or two um, parameters, one template parameters. And they're, once again, const tref. What a function does is it um, just compares a and b for equality and returns that result. So that function template essentially works with everything that provides an equal operator, so even for a std string. Below I'm using it first with an int in lines number 15 and 16. But there is also a specialization, and that specialization you can see in line number eight. And there I'm providing a specialization for double, because you all might have heard that or learned that in your computer science class, Floating point numbers have to be treated a little bit different because of their um, way they are, they are modeled internally. They may only slightly and um, a few bytes behind or bits uh, differ, and it may be enough for your um, purpose. But you all, most of the time don't need to be floats exactly the same bit pattern. So when you're asking whether two floats are equal or two doubles, then usually you're referring to a K up to, to a certain quantity. The, the rest, I, I don't really care about this. And this is what this um, second equal function does, this specialization here. It's a special case for when we are having a double. Then we are doing this um, A minus B and building the absolute value of it, so keeping it positive and then comparing whether the result of this is still less than a certain threshold. And if so, then we simply return that result. It's either true or false, even if it's not the case. And by that, I'm making this equal function work even for doubles correctly. 
So now I see we have one question here and the question is, are there special conditions for custom types? And that would be a good question where I would like a live audience because then I can ask back, what exactly do you mean by that? Um, maybe whoever asked that question can provide a little bit of more context to which slide it refers um, or what special conditions you are meaning or simply come after the second talk to the q and I think I will be there at some remote table and you can ask me live and directly. All right. This so far about our template specializations. And aside from function templates, we can also have class templates. This here is an example of a class template. And class templates are more or less like function templates. So a lot of rules from function templates apply to class templates as well. Um, there are a few differences. So class templates are introduced by the keyword template and the ankle brackets as every other template. The special case, or well, one of the special cases at least, um, kicks in if we are talking about what methods of a class, and this term methods of a class template, what I mean and how they are implemented. So if you are looking at function templates, you can only implement function templates at global scope. We, we can put it in a namespace, but that's it. If we have a class template and methods in there, for a regular class, we can choose whether we like to implement um, that method in lines or in the class or outside of the class. And we can, of course, do the same thing or we have the same choice if you're talking about class templates. And if we are deciding to provide the implementation in line for a class template, then things are still fairly trivial, like for a usual um, non-template class. So in my case here, I have this um, array struct. It is a class template. It takes two parameters, a type name t and a size t called size. So first one is once again a type parameter, second one is a non-type template parameter. And what is thing here models is what you're finding in the standard, uh, which is called dot array there. It's just a downstripped version of it, but it roughly does the same thing. It, for example, has the two methods data. One is const, the other one is non-const, and what they are doing is they're returning a pointer to the first element of the M data field, which you find below in line number 15. That's the member of this array or field of this array. It's of size size, so the compiler fills in the size we are specifying for it, and it's of type T. That's another thing we are specifying for this class template. And then it has a couple of other helper functions like size, so we can ask it for the size. And as you can see, this once again refers to the non-type template parameter. So there, there is no way that we can mess that up and have the same size to uh, array. So there are no risks of a buffer over or buffer underflow as long as you respect the size that is returned by this um, array class. Then we have the two other methods, begin and end, and of course, an index operator to get a single element out of this array. If you're looking closely, I do different things for the two data methods. So one of the data methods, the one for the non-const case, is implemented out of line. It's implemented below the class, while the one using the const version is implemented directly in the class. And as you can see in line number six for the const version, this is straightforward. You implement the method like you would always do it. The slightly special case kicks in for the implementation of the out-of-line um, data method in line number five, because this is shown below in line number 18 to 22. And what we have to do there is we have to tell the compiler for which class exactly this is, because we are now talking about a class template. So we have once again say, okay, this is a template, and we have to um, reiterate over the 
parameters or the arguments this type template takes. So we say type name t, size t size, and then it returns the t star that would be the same as we would write for a non class, uh, for a non class template, yes. And then we have to specify the namespace again. So this is the scope of the class. We say array, but this time we have to be specific and say in the ankle brackets that it's for t and size such that the compiler can map this and create the appropriate function or class method for us. I'm seeing a couple of other questions dropping in. So are there requirements that are placed on custom types, say dot h, if instead of an int or a string or a string primitive type? I'm not sure if I'm getting this question right. So I think it's a clarification for the former questions. Are there special conditions for custom types? And there are no special conditions for custom types I can think of. The only um, special thing, but that's the same for your standard library, is that you have to provide the comp compiler the full picture. So the compiler needs to see that entire template it needs to instantiate because it needs to instantiate it. So you cannot hide the some parts in the CPP file and have the other parts in a header file. So usually when it comes to templates, you either have everything in the header file because you have multiple users or you only have it in the CPP file because you have only users in that CPP file, so in that single translation unit. I hope that answers the question. We can now look at this glass template example in C++ Insights as well. And you suggested that I should increase the font size, so let's try that. Um, I hope that's better now. So this is the, uh, the code from the slide. It's my class template array. I have this out of line definition here for my data method. And then if I do the transformation now, then we can see But I still have here the primary template. So this is the version I wrote with, with all the planks to fill out. And here we have what the compiler makes up for us because if I go below, oh no, let's stay here and look at the other side. So what I'm requesting here from the compiler is an array of type int comma two. So this is the first thing the compiler makes up for us. It's from line number 29 and that matches that one here. And then I have now this data method, which returns an int. I have the const version, which returns an int. And my begin and end functions do the same thing. And below here, I do have the second version because I asked for double comma two. So the compiler does instantiate a version for double comma two. And then below here, I have the final version which is for char2. So this time data returns char star. And we can see one interesting difference here. Because compilers, when it comes to templates, um, have the ability to not create code if there is no use for it. And if you're looking at it, I'm creating these two instances of array here for um, the combination int two and double two called AI and AD, but I don't use them below. So none of the methods are really used. That's the reason why you do not see here any code, any function body for any of these methods. And this was the same for int. And if you're going down to the char case, because this char array I'm creating here called A is used in range-based for loop, now we are seeing that data places a call, call to um, store the address of, getting the pointer to the first element in my array. And we can now also see that the compiler fills in the two because I requested that array of size two. Would I have done this with size three? And in a moment, we can see that this two simply changes to three. 
and the code still stays correct. Are we all looking at this? It doesn't work. Worked as expected. Uh, I have to say five here, for example. Does this make things better? No, but that may be my setup, so it should work in reality. I'm sorry about that. So we have a few other questions. Are there circumstances where the compiler can do an implicit conversion for templates? No, there are no circumstances where it can do that, except if you are asking for it. So once you're starting providing the types with a specialization, um, no, um, Come to that later after the talk. It takes too much time now to, to come up with an example. But there are ways how you um, can tamper with that, but a compiler itself, if you're um, not calling for a specific template instantiation, um, has no way to enable implicit conversions. And the fonts are readable now. Excellent. All right. So then let's continue here. So we already looked a little bit in this class template instantiation. Um, we could see that it's very the same, very much the same as for function templates. There's one important exception, and that's that class templates cannot automatically deduce or derive their arguments. That's why I had to say in the sample I showed, array of int comma two. So each template argument must be specific explicitly. And if we are looking back at function templates, that's one of the cool things or one of the helpful things that we do not have to tell the compiler the type other than passing in that type. And there are good reasons why it's a little bit different for function uh, for class templates. But if you like your class templates to work more or less similar to function templates and do not have to rename the types or the non-type template parameters once again, then there is the C++ 17 exception for you. With C++ 17, we got what's called class template argument deduction, CTAT, and that works with a single parameter out of the box. So if your class template takes only one parameter, regardless whether it's a type or a non-type template parameter, then the compiler is able to deduce that and to map it. And if you have more um, than one parameter, then you need to write some deduction guide. But that's not topic of this talk today. So I see another question popping in. How can the array class be initialized with the string initializer if there is no constructor here? So let me see. Probably have the time. So if you're looking back at my array class I'm, I'm having here, the reason why that whole thing works is because I chose it to be a struct here and not a class. My data field is in fact public. And so this behaves like an aggregate initialization. And that's why I do not need to provide a constructor on my own, not even a default one because the elements of this array simply get initialized. We can see that, I believe, in the output of C++ insights below here. Here we can see, um, if you know the syntax, that we are initializing here, not just that array, but in the second pair of um, curlies, we are passing that values to an array in that class. And this version is, in fact, what um, stood array at least in, in Lib C++ does because it's very efficient and you get practically no overhead. So that's the way to do that. And there's another question. If you create arrays with the same type but different size, um, for example, array int comma two and array int comma three, does it generate code for the class or for each of two separately? 
does it have implications on size and speed? So if you change only one of these parameters or if you change the combination um, as its whole, the compiler needs to generate a new version of this class. This is, I believe, what we are seeing um, above here. So I have this um, char of two. So here we have it. That's what I was looking for before. So here I have from the compiler made for us an array instantiation of, size, of type char and size three. And below here, I have one for char comma two. And here I have char comma three. And below here, I have char comma two. So if you change only a single parameter here, change its type, change the value, you get a new instantiation. There is no common thing around them except that they are all have the name array. So it will affect your um, your size, so your binary grows larger, but then in the last step, you have a good chance that linker jumps in and you get um, link time optimization such that duplications, which are the same for all the types, are thrown out once again. But this is something you definitely have to watch out for and you need to control. But as I said initially, if you would write the type yourself and you would write the two different versions of that type, it would be the same um, code increase. So it's nothing different, just that you have to write it only once and maintain it only once if you're using a template. We can have another special thing if you are looking into class templates. They not necessarily need to be class templates to be there because we can also have method templates. A method template is what's shown in line 10 to 15 here. Um, when I'm having another template in my class template, in this case, a method template. It's once again introduced by the keyword template. And because in this particular case, we are looking already at a class template, which defines a type named T. The name T is chosen. So it's like a, creating a variable and then in a um, inner scope, this, a new variable with the same name that's shadowing. It works for variables. It doesn't work so well here. So I have to pick a different name. And the convention is often that the first parameter is two. The second one is you, but you are absolutely free to make up every name that follows the usual variable naming rules. So here I have this method template and it defines me an operator equals, which returns reference to such a foo type, which this class template is of, and it takes a const u ref. And internally, it does a static cast on that passed in parameter u to my class my class templates type t and then returns a, a copy of this or dereference this. And what this is, is essentially a conversion operator. Um, it converts everything that responds, of course, to a static cast from u to t. And what you can do with that is some probably not so sane thing. I can in line 23 create an instantiation of type fuint for my class, call it fi, assign the value three to it because I also happen to have a constructor taking a single argument. And then in line 24, I can say fe equals 2.5. With that, the conversion operator here kicks in and this 2.5 gets downcasted to an int. So it just two in the end, and that is assigned to MX, uh, the internal variable. You can have a look at this in C++ insights as well. And usually the transformation is a little bit faster, but because my laptop is doing so much with all this streaming thing, it's slowed down. So here, once again, we have the primary template, which we declared, compiler leaves that as it is, and then we have the instantiation for int here. This is from a class template foo, the instantiation. We can see once again here the constructor, which we request that is filled with the appropriate type. And then here I have the instantiation for my requested conversion operator. And in this case, 
it's a double. So that thing takes a double and then it static casts the double to an end. And because that works, that entire code compiles. So these are things that can help you if you have um, some class which needs to take in a bunch of different data types and you don't want to come up with a um, conversion or assignment operator for all of them because we're talking about 20 or 30 of these types, but they all share the same properties and they are all convertible to that thing with static cast then you can use a pattern like this. You don't need necessarily a class template on the outside. It works with the regular class as well. The only thing you have to watch out for, if that static cast fails, then you get this multi-pages long template errors probably where the compiler tells you that during the instantiation, it failed badly. But you will learn to handle them once you've seen them long enough. So there's another question. So if I got the explicit specialization, if I got to explicitly specialize, specialize the class, sorry for that, for every single combination of T and U, if you got to explicitly specialize the class for every single combination of T and U, um, yeah, then I feel probably sorry for you. Um, then the question is, if you really need the template, that could be because you like to have the same type there, that the same name. Um, maybe you also find out that there is some common functionality between them, which you can share. So how to answer with, with just that single sentence? And there's another thing. I always found it pretty difficult to digest templates and code. Your talk definitely gives me a good overview. Could you please share some good textbook references? Oh, okay. We talk about this later. So let's um, continue here with class templates inheritance. But thank you for that compliment. I'm happy about that. That's the mission. So what we can do is, because we are talking about classes and whether we um, suffix that with templates or not, doesn't matter. So a class template behaves like a class. That means that we can derive from a class template either with a regular template or with a class template. In this example here, I'm showing you the version where I derive from class template and the class that derives from is also a class template itself. And then a couple of questions occur. So you have to say, to tell the compiler, for which type you are instantiating this base class, because this base class now is a template, so the template itself needs the parameters to be filled in. And in my case, I'm showing here, my class foo and my class bar both take only a single type named t, so I decided to just pass that to my base class. But in fact, I could also chose to say that I'd like to publicly derive from, for example, a short, or um, a double whatsoever. That's the first thing. You can leave out parameters here. So if class bar would take more parameters than foo, then that's not a problem. All you have to care about is that foo needs some indication how or for which type it's going to be used and by that instantiated. So you have to be specific there. There's another thing. If you're looking at my function bar func in line number 12 of class bar. It tries to call the function of the base class func there. As you can see in line number five, my class foo comes through the function func. It doesn't do anything, but that's not a um, thing here. I try to call this function in my derived class. So this is the usual thing, calling the base class function in a derived class. Usually I advise my students to do it like in line number 14 for regular classes, because I don't like the noise that this, this um, error operator all the time creates. So I like just calling the naked function. But this doesn't work if you're deriving or if you're inheriting from a class template. And the simple nature of that is because there is not necessarily only one 
of this foos. You can publicly or privately derive multiple times from foo just with a different type. So we can, as here shown, derive public foo of t, comma, foo, uh, public foo, if you like, foo of double. That would work. And then there are two different functions called func. So one case, uh, or one way you can solve this is like in line number 14, for the single case here, be specific, say this error, and then the name of the function in the base class, in my case, foo. The more general way probably is like in line 16, provide the full namespace. So I like here to refer to foo of type t, colon, colon, and then the member function func. That way I could also call different versions of foo if I have derived from that multiple times as I shown before. We also have alias templates. Alias templates allow us to create synonyms for templates, if you like. And there's another question popping in. Must bar also be a template class or is bar colon public foo int also okay? Yes, bar doesn't need to be a template. It can just be a regular class. That's fine. So alias templates here, they once again start with the keyword template and they include brackets. And now I can once again use type name, non-type template parameters like in every other template. And this goes together with using. Now I say template size tn using char array. And char array is the name for that thing which I can use to refer to it later. And then I say that's equal to std array of type char but with size n. So the size is unknown. Now I can build or can use this like in line number eight, I can say char array of size 24. This is pretty useful if you have code where you're making up char arrays a lot of the time and you can simply make it easier for your users dropping that single um, type there. And it's more meaningful because everybody can share the same, same type because now it's type char array. And there's more to it. If you happen to have a product which compiles for multiple platforms and there you have slight variations because sometime you're using the std array and for the other platform you're using something like the array implementation I showed you before, they are more or less compatible but due to some circumstances you have to use the different types here. Then you can abstract that, sorry you have to use a macro here, but then you can say okay if there is a certain define on like product A, then my char array refers simply to my array type, and if not, it refers to std array. Both type this array with type char and leave the size open to specified by the user. And as you can see in line number 13, for the user code, it doesn't make a difference. As long as the API of these both types are the same, then you can simply abstract this and do not have to have this um, if they have in your code all over the place. So this is really helpful. Now let's, because the time is slightly running up, let's talk about guidelines for efficient use of templates. Templates generate code for us. So it's the same as we are copying and pasting our implementation and just changing types or values. And that means that the resulting binary can get larger, of course. Maybe the optimizer throws away a couple of these floats, but it doesn't have to. Sometimes we overlook this fact and then people refer to it to code bloat when it comes to templates because for templates, the compiler does this for us. But essentially, it's the same as we could have done it by ourselves. And we probably would have without templates because we need the types, right? This is in our control. We can control this. And here's an example. Um, this is an example of passing value on the length. So it's typical C or POSIX API, if you like. It's very error prone uh, because as you can see below and then line number 19, 
uh, 225. I'm creating two different buffers here and calling read and sound. And I all the time have to say buffer and then size of buffer. So what's the size of this buffer? And I'm not sure if you're quick enough to spot this, but I got it wrong for line number 24 and 25. Sadly, I'm passing in buffer instead of probably buffer 2, but I'm passing the size of buffer 2. So with that, I created myself a nice, uh, beautiful buffer overflow, which is probably not so good for your customers. It's, it may be a good case for job security. So if you're the one who can fix that quickly after customers complain, then that's probably a good thing. But other than that, it's it's really nasty to have to deal with such problems. It's it's more to read and to write, and you can get it wrong. I got it wrong a couple of times. So what can we do about this? Well, we, we can plug in um, standard library containers like StudArray. We use a stood array as shown of type jar and say it's of size uh, 1024 for read and send here. Sad thing is um, that then doesn't compile anymore because line 20 and 21 will result in a compile error. We only have a function that takes a stood array of, si of jar and 1024. It cannot pass in there a stood array of jar and 2048. What would that mean anyway? So that doesn't help. What you can do, good solution here for starters would be we're making that the function template. We are keeping the standard library container, stood array, we're keeping it typed to jar because that we need. But we saw the trick that the compiler can derive the size on its own. So we say, okay, let, let the compiler that use the size of that thing. We do that for read and write, often for send and read. And now our code compiles. We are happy. That's good. We used an SDL container. We have a template in place. That's quite good. We have to write this code only once. Excellent. But now we have the danger to create code plot. As soon as the example is here, I'm showing you the risk is near zero, if not zero, because sand will be result in an inline function, so it doesn't matter how many versions you're creating there. It's essentially the same as, as calling write directly, except that the users can drop um, saying what the size of this thing is, because as you, you can see below, we now only have to pass in the buffer, which is the key here. But my read function maybe is bigger, maybe my send function grows, so at some point it could start to matter um, that we are creating multiple instances because we have a lot of different sized buffers there. So it's a danger. And how can we avoid this? We can avoid it by using another type of the standard library, which comes through C20, it's span, it stood span. And as you can see above, it's we're simply now saying in send const span of char by reference and if that thing the name data. And the key thing here is we got the template removed. Just to talk about templates, so it may be um, suspicious why I'm removing the template here, but we are talking about code bloat and how to control it. So making send and read a template can result in code bloat. If we are using that span type, which we have to type only for type jar, and we are assuming that's all that function needs to take, then this danger is gone. And the good thing is we have a chance here to use this span, even backwards compatible, because I will show you an implementation in a minute. What span does is it stores a pointer in a length. And the key here is that it stores a length. Because it stores the length, the length doesn't need to be specified for the template. That's why span only takes a single argument as its template parameter. And that's the abstraction we often need. Because having the size specified isn't necessarily um, vital here. It's not key. We're spending a couple of bytes more to store the lengths in favor of creating a bunch of different instantiations of our function. And this here is span. It fits on 30 lines of code if you omit a little bit um, of extra things. So the standard library version is 
a lot bigger. But this does the essential parts that works with the code as shown before. So I have a default constructor from above. You can see it's a class template taking a type named T. And then I have a bunch of other constructors which essentially convert from an array, as we saw before in line number 9 and line number 13, to a combination of a pointer and a size. And in line number 16 and 17, I have a version which converts from a std array to a span. And the more constructors you add, the more flexible the span gets and um, from more types you can create it. And then we have size function, which refers to the internal number size, you can see in line number 29. And of course, a data function, which refers to my data member on line 28. And an empty and the begin and end, and we are down. We have span where we can iterate over in a range-based for loop, we can query the size, the compiler that uses all that stuff for us, we are fine. So the guidelines for efficient use of templates would be move code, which stays the same for all instantiations in a base class if we are talking about class templates. Wait if storing an additional type of value, like in span, is better than storing it in a template parameter because it reduces the number of different instantiations. But you spend RAM, essentially. And for function templates, we can say, check if we can use them as an API only, so that the function template is only in wrapper, which redirects to our internal non-template version, like in the send example where I call the POSIX write, to unfold it, to provide a user with a safe API with less to type, and still have the benefits of not loading so much the code because we are using internally a different version. So the layer of the template is very thin. The compiler probably inlines it, and everything is nice. We talked a lot about types. Um, you may not have noticed that, but most of the things was about types. How we instantiate a template, it's about types. Sometimes it's about values, but they are known at compile time. And Thinking in types can be the following. Because we know the type at compile time, we can do things to it at compile time. We can modify it. We can query its properties. And the example here is that I can check whether a certain type is a pointer. And how do I do that? This is a short version of what's in the type traits header. It starts at A here with a struct, template struct, integral constant. It takes a class T, and it uses that deduced type to create a non-type template parameter v. Internally, it has a static const expect t named value where it assigns this value to. And then in b, in line number 9 and 10, I can create an integral constant of type bool true and type bool false. I assign that to a using type called true and false type. And then in c, I'm creating another struct template which takes, once again, a signal type named t. It's called isPointer, and it derives from false type. So this is my primary template. And then I'm providing in d a specialization for that template, isPointer. And now if you're looking closely at 9 number 20, it says isPointer in ankle brackets t. So this is a specialization for t star. And this one, we are, this time we are deriving from true type. And if you now used it in the code below with this pointer ankle brackets in star, colon, colon value, this yields to true because the specialization for pointer is chosen and it yields to the internal value of my integral constant of true. And it's the other way around. If we are calling it with a not a pointer as a type, then it yields to no. So these are the two static asserts below. And now I see we are running out of time slightly. So here I have my class array, uh, class template array we've seen before. And the goal is now that we are applying this std is pointer to this class because we are saying we want to limit it to not be able to be instantiable with an array of pointers or for an array of pointers. And we created this is pointer type trait before. There's a version in the standard library in the type trait, et cetera. And I'm using that in line number five here at A. 
and the code in B low in line 24 will no longer compile because this static assert is triggered. It will give you a bunch of lines of um, error output, but in the end it will say that your static assert has failed. You can do better using C++20 and using concepts there. The key difference is that we have line 20 where we have this requires clause where we put in our type trait. Now we say it's not stood, po stood is pointer v of t and the error message is much shorter and more precise because the compiler now exactly knows what is going on and what's wrong. And line 22 will still not compile, but this time with a much nicer error message. And the final thing we have here is uh, we have a const expr if, and the key is that it's written differently than it's spelled. So we say it's a const expr if, but it's written if const expr in code. And that thing is an if which is evaluated at compile time. So only one of the many branches you can have in that if will survive at or will live in your binary. All the other branches go away, assuming that you're not instantiating this function template for different types, then you will have the different branches in there for the different template instantiations. And what I can do with um, this context for if is, for example, I have a function template called get value here, and it's supposed to always return me a value because I do not want to check whether that thing is a pointer or just a regular type. I call get value there, and in the context for if I apply once again my studious pointer on this type t to figure out, oh, yes, that's a pointer, then I first assert whether it's a null pointer or not, and otherwise I return to the, um, the dereferenced version of t. If it's not a pointer, then I simply return t. And that allows me to place all these calls below to get value um, once for a regular int as an i and once for a pointer as an ip, and they can also pass an integer like 43. There's a variation to it. I can also use that to say, okay, I like to have a function template which converts me everything into a string, a std string. I name this function str, and I use a const expr if this time with another type trait from the standard library called is convertible. And this checks whether there is a way for std string to convert this t I'm passing in to a std string. If so, I'm simply returning t because the constructors of std string will kick in there and then convert it to a std string. And otherwise, I will call the method to string for std string, which converts, for example, numbers into a std string. And this allows me to call it or to use it in line 13 and 14 once passing a std string. It's not efficient. We, we can do better here. If you listen to Nico's talk yesterday about move semantics, we can improve a lot here, but that's the focus only on templates. And I can pass in in line number 14 here my 42, and that simply works. And I'm sorry that I'm not able to answer any more questions here. I think we. Um, uh, we are out of time, essentially. As I said, we can talk about this later in the Q&A or if you reach me at the remote table. At this point, for the first talk, I can say I'm fertig. If you tuned in for the first uh, couple of slides, you know the translation. I've wrote, a, or I'm in the progress to finish that book, Notebook C++ Tips and Tricks with Templates. You can get the discounted version here. It's on LeanPub and uh, Hopefully, it will be soon um, be in a printed version available as well. So remember the applause Q&A. So if you like to applause for John or for all the volunteers, there's time to do this right now. Other than that, I hope to see you or you listen to me uh, for the second part in roughly 30 minutes. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and see you later. Bye-bye.